Alright, let's get right into it. Problem 1. The monthly revenue R earned by selling X decorative pillows is given by R of X equals 85X minus 0.25X squared, and the cost C of producing that many decorative pillows is C of X equals 21.25X plus 1,750. First, we are asked how many decorative pillows must we sell to maximize revenue and what is the maximum revenue? Now our revenue function, if we rearrange terms, we see more easily it is a quadratic function. In standard form, it would be negative 0.25x squared plus 85x plus zero. This is a parabola which is opening down because the leading coefficient is negative, so therefore it has a maximum value at its vertex. This is what we now need to find. The x-coordinate of the vertex is given by negative b over 2a, b is the coefficient of the linear term 85, a is the leading coefficient negative one quarter, so negative 85 over two times negative a quarter. The quarters cancel out, two times one quarter down in the denominator is one half, 85 divided by one half is 85 times two, that's 170. So we are supposed to sell 170 pillows to maximize revenue. What is the revenue associated with selling 170 pillows? R of 170, we simply plug that into our revenue function and this will evaluate to $7,225. Next, the profit P earned by producing and then selling X decorative pillows is given by P of X is the difference between revenue and cost, R of X minus C of X. So how many decorative pillows must be sold to maximize profit and what is the maximum profit? Now first we simply compute what is R of X minus C of X. 85x minus 0.25x squared minus the quantity 21.25x plus 1750 will end up being negative 0.25x squared plus 63.75x minus 1750. The vertex, again this is a downward opening parabola, so the vertex represents a maximum, is given by the same formula, x equals negative b over 2a. a is the same here, the leading coefficient, but b, the linear term, has changed. So we have negative 63.75 over 2 times negative 1 quarter. This evaluates to 127.5. Now parabolas are symmetric around their vertex and we can't sell half a pillow. So since we have this symmetry, it doesn't matter if we sell half less or half more than the vertex. So we're either going to plug in 127 or 128 pillows to maximize our profit. We're just going to go ahead and plug in 127. It wouldn't matter. We'd get the same result either way. Plugging in 127, we get negative 0.25 times 127 squared plus 63.75 times 127 minus 1750, which resolves to $2,314 is our maximum possible profit. Problem two, let f of x be the rational function, negative 12x plus 12 divided by x squared minus 12x plus 35. What are the zeros of f of x? What are the vertical asymptotes of f of x? What are the horizontal asymptotes of f of x? And let's solve the rational inequality, f of x is less than zero. Now to find the zeros of a rational function, we simply set the numerator equal to zero, and this quickly solves by x equals one. To find vertical asymptotes, we set the denominator to zero. The denominator x squared minus 12x plus 35 factors quite nicely as x minus seven times x minus five. So x equals seven and x equals five are both vertical asymptotes of this function. Now, because the denominator has larger degree, it is a degree two polynomial, whereas the numerator is a degree one polynomial, any rational function where the denominator has larger degree has horizontal asymptote y equals zero. Finally, let's solve the rational inequality f of x is less than zero. Now, every root that we found and vertical asymptote is of an odd multiplicity. Therefore, they all represent places where the function will change sign. So the function will change sign at x equals one, but also at x equals five and seven. So let's just compute f of zero. Zero is an easy number to plug in. All the terms of the x vanish and we get 12 over 35, which is positive. So everywhere to the left of x equals one, the function is positive. It changes sign at x equals one. From one to five, it is negative. It changes sign again. From five to seven, it is positive. And then at seven, it changes sign. So from seven onward, it is negative again. 
So where was it negative between one and five and then from seven to infinity? So overall, we can represent this with the following two intervals. We are not including any endpoints here. X equals one is a root or zero of the function, which is not included by the inequality f of x is less than zero. X equals five and x equals seven are vertical asymptotes and are not even in the domain. Next up, here's a graph of a rational function. We are told that the numerator is of degree three. Let's find an equation for f of x and compute the value f of 3. Observe just by looking at the picture that 3 is a little bit to the right of where this picture cuts off. f of 3 appears to be slightly less than 1. So whatever answer we get, assuming the picture is reasonably accurate, we're looking for something slightly less than 1. Now we have a non-crossing root at x equals minus 2. Therefore, x plus 2 has even multiplicity in the numerator, and the only other root we find is at x equals 1, which is crossing, so x minus 1 is an odd multiplicity factor of the numerator. The numerator was given to be of degree 3. We already have an even multiplicity factor and an odd multiplicity factor, so the only thing we can possibly have is some constant times x minus 1 to the first times x plus 2 squared. This is the only way we can put an odd power on x minus 1 and an even power on x plus 2 and still end up with degree 3. This also tells us there are no other roots that are not shown. Next, we see that there is a horizontal asymptote indicated of y equals 1. This is, this is a horizontal asymptote, and it is not y equals 0. This tells us the numerator and denominator have the same degree. Also, the ratio of leading coefficients should be uh, the horizontal asymptote y equals 1. Therefore, they have the same leading coefficient. We also find three vertical asymptotes that we can read off at x equals minus 3, x equals minus 1, and the axis x equals 0. They're all a sign-changing asymptote, so they must have odd multiplicity. But we know we're looking for a degree 3 denominator, and we already found three vertical asymptotes, so the only possible denominator is the same leading coefficient a as the numerator, then x plus 3 from the vertical asymptote of x equals minus 3, x plus 1 from the vertical asymptote of x equals minus 1, and just x, or x minus 0, from the vertical asymptote of x equals 0. We know that the leading coefficient of the denominator equals the leading coefficient of the numerator because the horizontal asymptote y equals 1 is given by the ratio of leading coefficients. So we put 1 over the other, we can cancel out that leading coefficient a, and f of x must be given by the following formula. There's no other choice. Now we can simply compute f of 3 by plugging in x equals 3. We get 2 times 5 squared over 3 times 6 times 4, and this simplifies to 25 over 36, which indeed is a little bit less than 1, which is what we were expecting. Next, problem 4. This is actually four small sub-problems. We are asked to solve four exponential equations. First, 2 to the negative 11x plus 3 minus 8 to the x squared plus 1 equals 0. Next, log base 10 of x plus log base 10 of x minus 8 equals 3. Fourth, 27 to the minus 6x plus 17 plus 19 equals 107. And finally, the natural log of x squared minus 6x plus 29 equals the natural log of negative 13x plus 19. So we'll just work through these one by one. For part A, we observe that 8 is a power of 2. So if we move the 8 to the x squared plus 1 to the right side, we'll call it 2 cubed to the x squared plus 1. Now we can use properties of exponents to call that right side 2 to the 3x squared plus 3 by multiplying the exponents 3 and x squared plus 1. We now have one power of 2 equals another power of 2. Therefore, the exponents must be equal. Negative 11x plus 3 must equal 3x squared plus 3. This simplifies to 3x squared plus 11x equals 0. There are two solutions to this, x equals 0 or x equals negative 11 over 3. Next up, <clears throat> log base 10 of x plus log base 10 of x minus 8, we will collect into a single logarithm. Log base 10 of x times x minus 8 equals 3. We'll now raise 10 to both sides to get rid of that logarithm. x times x minus 8 in other words, x squared minus 8x, must equal 10 to the third, or 1,000. We now have a quadratic, x squared minus 8x minus 1,000 equals 0, so we're going to use the quadratic formula to solve for x. This works out to be two solutions. 8 
plus or minus the square root of 8 squared plus 4,000, or 4,064, all divided by 2. Observe that the 64 is really quite small compared to the 4,000. So this is more or less going to be given by the square root of 4,000. And then we can see that 8 plus that over 2 will be a fairly large negative number. It's approximately 38.87. And 8 minus that will be a negative number. It's approximately negative 27.87. But in the original expression, we had the log base 10 of x. So x cannot be negative. Observe that for 38.87, both x and x minus 8 will be positive. Therefore, that is in the domain of both original logarithms, whereas negative 27.87 is not in the domain of either original logarithm. So we discard that negative solution and only uh, present x is about 38.87. Exactly 8 plus the square root of 8 squared plus 4,000 all divided by 2 is the only legitimate solution. Moving on to part c. First, we subtract 19 from both sides. Now we're going to take a log of both sides. You could take the log base 27, that'd be fine, but it's not the most common way to do this. We'll take a natural log. So on the right, we simply have a natural log of 88, and on the left, the natural log of 27 to a power, we can bring that power out as a factor. Now we can solve for x. We divide both sides by the natural log of 27, then subtract 17 and divide by negative 6. And finally, in the last part, since the log of one quantity equals the log of the other, those two quantities must be the same. So x squared minus 6x plus 29 is equal to negative 13x plus 19. This becomes the quadratic x squared plus 7x plus 10 equals 0, which has two solutions, x equals negative 5 or negative 2. Checking the original expressions, both negative 5 and negative 2 will give positive quantities to be plugged into both of the original logarithms. So both of these are in fact solutions. Problem 5, an object is heated to 217 degrees Fahrenheit. Then it is allowed to cool in a room whose air temperature is held constant at 83 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature u of the object, t minutes after being placed in the room, is given by u of t equals 83 plus 134 times e to the negative 0 0.0739 times t. What will be the temperature of the object after 8 minutes? Well, here we're simply given 8 minutes to be the time. And for part b, how long will it take until the temperature of the object is 88 degrees Fahrenheit? So in part A, we're just computing u of 8 minutes. We plug in t equals 8 and compute the result. It's approximately 157.19 degrees. But all you have to do is plug in t equals 8. The real work is in part B. How long will it take until the temperature of the object is 88 degrees Fahrenheit? So we know that the resulting temperature should be 88. What is unknown is the time. So we have u of t which is 83 plus 134 times e to the negative 0.0739t. We set it equal to 88. Subtract 83 from both sides, then divide by 134, take a natural log, and divide by negative 0.0739 to solve for t is approximately 45.11 minutes.